What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Hi, everybody. It's Winnie Sun here, your host on the Renegade Millionaire Show. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. We are in L.A. at TuneIn Studios. As you know, I'm Managing Director and Financial Advisor at Sun Group Wealth Partners here in beautiful Southern California. And if you haven't had a chance, please follow me at Twitter. I'm really active there at Sun Group WP, and I'll let you know next time I'm on, I'm on CNBC. And you can follow me on my column at Uh, that I write for Forbes, which I'm really excited about sharing my next uh, piece with you. Um, I can't tell you too much, but it's a really cool Father's Day piece. So I hope you will uh, tune into that. And with that, oh my goodness, I got to tell you, this next gentleman who I'm going to introduce you to is somebody, I've read his bio probably two or three times already. And every time I'm reading it, I start laughing and I start Mm. cheering up. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's a good thing. It is? Yeah. Oh. Goodness. I was like laughing so hard. My husband's like, what's, what, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I'm preparing for the show tomorrow. <laughs> but let me introduce you. Jared, say your last name for him so I don't, don't sleep. Jingle Jared Goodstad. That is so awesome. And Jared, you were born in Toronto, Canada. Oh, yeah. Right? And they say. T-Dot, home of Drake. Hoo-hoo. And I, I heard this saying, I, I think that I've never met a Canadian I didn't love. It's Have strange. I spent my whole life trying to figure out how to leave Canada, and all of a sudden, we're our company was just bought by a bunch of Canadians. And I'm so happy to be back. Woo-hoo. It's the people are really cool there. I mean, we're kind of like bizarro versions of Australians. <laughs> bizarro, because <laughs> usually I get along with Australians too. They're just a little more wild than us, and we're and we're a little weirder. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you weirder? Uh, just Canadians all have a wacky sense of humor. I think you're a little weird, though. I yeah, say. we are weird, but in a, in a very lovable way. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> and I think, I mean, I thank you for being, not only, I mean, you were early to the show, he brought gifts. Goodness, how can you not love? So you're a graduate of NYU, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think we should run through some of your bio because sure. you, you got they need to know what I was cracking up about. So you were a graduate from NYU, and in college, you were in a never quite made it band mm-hmm. called Group Sounds. Yeah. Maybe it's the name of the group. <laughs> <laughs> there was other issues. We had a guy in our band who used to take his pants off, but that's a whole other oh, that, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be actually pretty huge right now. <laughs> Time and place, right? Yeah. So you went. So you created this band to like help pay for grad school. Well, I was hoping that at some point I would become a big rock star and be able to quit grad school. So it was kind of an insurance against my future. That never happened. Uh, but I did have a lot of fun playing and. I ended up meeting a lot of people who, f- like, were the foundation of what later became my business through playing in bands, meeting really cool entrepreneurial people, meeting really cool musical people, mm-hmm. and really figuring out where those people fit in my world. Some people, like my bandmate Jesse now, runs business development at our company. Oh, cool. Yeah. And he came in three years after the business was established, but I just remembered I really liked having fun with him being on the road. I, he was really good at uh, being, like, a salesperson. So, you know, uh, I think that a lot of the lessons I learned being in a band really applied to how I became successful later. How interesting. Yeah, I, there's a book idea in there at some point. If you yeah. can run a band, you can run a business. Oh, my gosh, I kind of love this idea. <laughs> We're going to have to talk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to write this down. Hmm, maybe my next book. Hmm. I got a couple in the hopper, but this one sounds like a winner. We should talk. <laughs> yeah. I love this idea. So then, okay, so let's talk about that. So a lot of people want to be in bands. I mean, we a good friend of mine, Jeff Timmons, who was just in the from 98 Degrees. I mean, a lot of people start with music, but how mm-hmm. do you transition to, like, you're basically like the jingle powerhouse man yeah, today? I, you know, it was an interesting time in my life because, you know, had I made it in the band, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here today because a lot of my friends – that ended up getting signed, it's a difficult road for anyone who's an artist because it's really not designed to empower and make people who are in the industry as a band or a rapper or a country star. It's not meant to necessarily make them generationally rich. It's meant to, you know, these hold co's, much like in any business, are trying to figure out how to continue to grow and 
uh, as you know, physical products kind of diminish in, in the record space, th- uh, these record companies have had to become creative. So they've become everything from like branding agencies to touring to merch. And it's all in, not in a negative way, but just it, it's a fact that it's been taken away from the artists who used to have a lot more avenues to walk down and figure out how to you know, uh, become entrepreneurs while they're developing their career. I uh, was my day job working in television shows after I graduated from NYU while still playing in the band. And the only time I ever made money as an artist wasn't when I played shows and it wasn't selling merchant shows and it wasn't selling CDs. It was putting my music in the TV shows and then a year later getting royalties for it. And as soon as I got my first check for putting my music in like five seconds in a Chappelle show episode, I was like, that's the idea. I need to scale that times a million and figure out how to get more music and TV shows. So... It really came from this dumb idea where I was like, okay, that's I, that's the first time I made a dollar in the music business. Let's do more of that. And I went back to all the bands I ever played with, anyone I ever toured with, any artist I ever met who had music lying on the shelf. And there was a lot of people who had created music at the time that weren't getting publishing deals and weren't getting record deals. And we became a bridge between those artists and people who were making TV shows. Uh, and at, at that point, that's really was the jump off for the Jingle Punks idea. It was how do we become a bridge? Mm-hmm. And we became this mega distribution platform for all the unsigned, unloved musical assets of the world and pl- pushed it into TV shows at a time where television was about to have the biggest explosion of content ever, which was unscripted television. If I told you that I saw the world of Honey Boo Boo and the Kardashians coming at that time when I started, I'd be lying to you. I just happened to start up a company at the exact right time. Because wow. anyone else doing production music before us were really catering it towards a world where it was scripted television, commercials, radio, and unscripted to, to us represents 90% of our marketplace. Wow. So how much music do you have at your company? How much do you control? We have a lot. We have, uh, well... Two months ago, we only had about 250,000 copyrights. Only had about. Only. And then when we got acquired by this Canadian company, Olay, they already had a production music catalog called mm-hmm. Music Box. Mm-hmm. We put those two things together and we're the managing, uh, I guess, we're managing the asset of production music under the Olay banner. So now we have 500,000 tracks. It really puts us uh, above and beyond the competition of, you know, Universal's production music library, Sony's, you know, we believe that not only do we have a better and wider offering of dynamic music, but we also have this amazing distribution platform. Part of our company's DNA is we're a tech company. So the way that you search and find music and aggregate music is part of our secret sauce. That's what I thought was really cool. I read that. So like, for example, if I was interested in music that sort of sounded like you, you too, mm-hmm. I could just type music that sort of sounds like you too. There's an app for that, <laughs> you know, and that's uh, our algorithm is really, you know, my parents every day, they're like scratching their head because my brother went to Princeton. My sister, you know, was a very successful athlete growing up. They're like, how did this guy become like an inventor and have a patent and start a successful company? Because uh, Never it, underestimate. It, it was a very bizarre path to where I got, and it required a lot of, you know, just uh, blind faith. And, it, it, you know, it, people always come up to me and they're like, how do we – start a company, how do we do this, how do we do that? I'm like, you put your head down and, and you just work. <laughs> we, we don't really know how we got here. Wow, I don't know how I got a... here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how long has this been from beginning to start to where we are today? So 2008 is the jump off. Mm-hmm. The uh, day I met Dan DeMole, my business partner, was called The Big Kahuna. Mm-hmm. My wife and his wife, we were dating them at the time, and they were like, oh, my boyfriend's smart. You should meet my boyfriend. And, like, (laughs) they each said that to each other. And we ended up meeting each other, and I was like, okay, you're a smart guy. I was like, well, here's an idea. (laughs) And uh, that night we went out. We got super-duper drunk. The night is called the Big Kahuna because we went to, like, (laughs) ten different bars. We got in a margarita fight. I changed clothing three times. Uh, I saw the Black Keys play. I ended up going to, like, Beatrice Inn, and he ended up falling over a set of, like, bar stools and getting thrown out. And I was like, <laughs> I think I want to start a business with that guy. That guy's cool. The next day, he showed up with his laptop, and we just started the business. We started coding, and I took all my music from a hard drive, and I said, can you figure out how to tag this music so it's easy to access on this hard drive, and then let's make that the jump off. So he's the tech. He's the tech. Even he though I come from, like, an interactive 
telecommunications background. Mm-hmm. I'm not the guy who's going to sit there and, you know, look at two million lines of code and figure out, you yeah. know, the Ruby on Rails strategy for us. It's amazing because there's a lot of people that are in the music business that have started production music companies mm-hmm. that haven't, you know, done what we've done because it's a multi-tiered approach. But most people only see Jingle Punk's The Fun Thing, which is our marketing story and me out every night with clients. And But if you go to our office, there's a sophisticated back end that – you know, we sometimes, uh, you know, as a as a business owner, you can forget <laughs> all of the things that make it all hum. And there's no real piece of the business that you could eliminate and still have the story that we have. That's incredible. The sales story. So there's that. There's the tech. There's an administration story. There's a – but the glory usually in our company goes to the creatives, the composers, and the sales staff, which is – but, it, you know, it's a team effort that makes the whole wheel work. I love that. And, you know, your motto is what would Weird Al do? Mm-hmm. Is it still your motto? Yes. So every, I love this. Every day I wake up and I think, what would Weird Al do? <laughs> um, again, it goes down to the, the band story. When I was in New York, uh, you know, as a bunch of my whole, you know, band was a bunch of goofy Jewish guys, myself included. <laughs> and when you're competing with beautiful men like the Strokes and the White Stripes and people that are a lot cooler than you, it's like, okay, what lane do we occupy? So we had a guy in <laughs> the our bike lane. Yeah, it was in the bike. Exactly. <laughs> so we had a guy in our band. I was like, you got to do something on stage to get us some attention. Come on. And he'd start taking off his pants. And that's when we started <laughs> getting in page six. And we were written about kind of like we never fully broke through, but we started to be like, oh, there's the spark. We're better at marketing than we were at the actual creation of a musical product. And I was like, that's something that – that's what Weird Al would do. Weird Al, I'm sure, at some point said, how can I, I – love music. How can I make a career in it? Well, he ended up doing the least obvious thing po- possible, which is spoofing Michael Jackson songs and Queen songs. And I loved that growing up because he got my attention. And how do you, you know, market to the most, you know, base people in the world? It's like, you know, 10-year-old kids in a high school who are, like, picking their boogers and don't know anything about music. That was cool to me. And then when we started our business, again, the same lessons applied. We started this production music company. There was 10 other people in the space. Nobody wanted to pay attention to us. And the big breakthrough story was there's this uh, conference every year called Real Screen, and it's actually going on in L.A. right now, Real Screen West. And now, now you're invited to speak at the conference probably. Yeah, I do. <laughs> but um, so they said, look, you guys probably as a new business can't afford the gold and the silver and the platinum package because those are like $75,000. You host <laughs> oh, yeah, a cocktail benefit for you know, A&E or NBC and you put your logo on there and look at those cocktail things no one's really paying attention no so they said Jared anybody. what about for $5,000 we'll give you the toilets I said sold yeah <laughs> so we put so interesting that toilet they... pucks with our logo in it and by the end of the day all these executives were coming up to us saying I pissed on your company and they were <laughs> high-fiving us because we put a, my face in the toilet <laughs> and the, the logo <laughs> of our company in the toilet so and they, that was actually a sponsorship that was package? it was called the brown package now, that's, kind of, <laughs> that's kind of genius on their part you know what well, I mean well it was I I think that it was an amazing moment because it was genius on them to offer it up to us who would obviously say yes, <laughs> but to figure out what to do with it because most people would be like, no, that's below me. I don't want to advertise yeah, yeah, yeah. in the toilet, but everyone's got to go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we had this occupied audience, and in the, the girls' restroom, we had a big picture of my face that said, buy our jingles or get your jingle on. So when they closed <laughs> the stall, I'd be there. That's and so awesome. Yeah, we ended up doing that. We did uh, the toilet pucks, and year after year, we've tried to adapt it, but – you know, now that our company is bigger, they always say, can we get interest you in the bigger package? And we're like, no, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Now you've got 70 plus employees, like yeah. multiple countries now. Yep. Yeah, so we have Toronto, New York, Los Angeles, Nashville, and uh, we have a partnership in Brazil where we've like franchised it like a Burger King. Uh-huh. And we are hoping to do more franchises for our business. So anybody who has a successful music composing company that doesn't have a library to upsell, mm-hmm. we can figure out ways to go in new territories, give them to key access to our business and uh, as long as it's a place where you know we're able to track th- where the money goes and you know we're not going to get our entire uh, <laughs> you know catalog uh, pirated it seems <laughs> like there's a lot of territory still to grow very cool yeah. that's very cool and how we met we just do I guess somehow very nonchalantly through we have a mutual friend oh yeah our, our buddy Chitty Bang love him <laughs> love him I love the guy he's like a brother to me but um, so you worked with Chitty for a little bit yep so uh, at one point our business started a management division and uh a brother of mine, uh, Aunt Martini, who is his man or was his manager. I'm not sure if he currently is. Not anymore. <laughs> R.I.P. But um, <laughs> was uh, you know trying to integrate his world into ours and saying, look, if Jingle Punks has this great gateway between 
artists and brands as we started to do sexier things like big commercials and pitches for Pepsi. Mm -hmm. Let's fold some artists into it at the pitch level. And we did something for Pepsi, which they ended up rejecting, but it became a single on Chitty's album. And I wrote it with Chitty and Sam Hollander called Happening. And uh, that, ended I love that, song. that ended up becoming one of the most successful copyrights in our library, but it started as a Pepsi pitch. That's awesome. Many people don't know that. <laughs> well, that's so fascinating. Well, you you certainly, I can see why the two of you get along. You're both so dynamic. I mean, and I turn- like writing with him. You know, he's been to our studios in L.A. recently again. He's, you know, he is the embodiment of a new type of artist who you have to say yes to a lot of things in order to figure out how to put all the pieces together. Yeah, he's a good soul. He's a yeah. good human being. He yeah, is. He is. And you're, 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 you're so young yourself. You're only 37 years mm-hmm. old. So what's next? What's next for you? So I am excited because for the first time ever since we've been in business, it's been head down the whole time. And then we got acquired by this company, Olay, out of Canada, which is a great publishing company. How much did they, they, they acquire you from? Are we uh, allowed to say? Uh, I can't say, but it was, it was good. If you, uh, you know, I always uh, put this sort of, uh, story out there. It was more than what Sony ATV paid for the Beatles catalog. There you went go. So, and we have no hits. So we didn't write "Let It Be," and we didn't write, uh, you awesome. know, "Hey Jude." But it was it was a good thing, and it was a good thing for the entire company because we were never the kind of company that built it to sell it. We built it to be a brand and continue to find ways to be more dynamic. We'd almost hit the wall in terms of how much bigger we could get without almost – I look at them as this really, really creative entrepreneurial bank, and we are the front-end creative of it. They might think differently. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're putting our heads together and saying any place that we have done business with in the past, how can we amplify it with their resources? How can we start looking at all the places we're not working and amplify it? And they have an amazing back catalog. Like we're the production music arm of it and the production side of it, but they have the catalog of Timbaland. They have wow. Rush, classic Canadian bands. They've bought all of these amazing um, catalogs, including Sony Pictures, which everything from like, uh, I don't know how many years, but decades of music from TV shows. And we want to find entrepreneurial ways to like amplify those catalogs and become a sales mechanism and plug those things into commercials, TV shows, films. And it's kind of amazing because I never really saw this coming. And every step of the way, it's, you know, I always say, aside from what we're, we're to do, I'm like, every day is like my first day on earth. So I'm always excited and enthused and surprised when good things happen because it's like I don't necessarily uh, have like all the basics down of, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, how to get from point A to point B. And I'm very matter. absent-minded you about know. things, but I'm very focused mm-hmm. on the idea of marketing music. I love the Jingle Punk story. I love what we've built here. And there's going to be opportunities for us to diversify our company and become really a 360 media company over time. But I've also seen a lot of people try and pivot into things that they're not necessarily suited for too early. And like you said, I'm not even 40 yet. And so there's still some uh, legs left in my there's <laughs> in just this plenty run. Of legs. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. And it's just so impressive that you've taken something that's a passion mm-hmm. and truly become very successful at it in a kind of a different way. But you, you found a niche, yeah. you focused, mm-hmm. and then you just moved. I think that that is the story of how like most entrepreneurs do stuff. It's... You know, everyone from Branson to Ahmed Ergen, all the heroes that I found, Geffen. And look, they specialized. And you can – you look at them now and you're like, oh, my God, they must have always run this, like, amazing diversified empire. No, David Geffen started in publishing and management. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, uh, Branson started in putting out records and, have like, doing mail order and stuff like that. And eventually you figure out just the tricks of what works for you in business. That's why I love the band analogy. I had – I didn't go to Harvard and get an MBA. I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't know – that I would ever be running a business with 70 people. I knew that when I was in a band, I was the organized leader of it, and I could get five people from A to B, create a product, get some money you know, for playing on stage, and keep moving forward. And all the stories that I had, like the sh- dropping off shirts and hats for you guys here, that's my merch, you know? And, uh, and we loved it. Thank the you. The biz dev strategy, I call that touring. And I'm always on the, you know, you want to make more money in a business? Tour. <laughs> you know, get on tour. You want to figure out how to, you know, keep your employees happy? I look at equity as the publishing story. You know, there's an amazing amazing story from Sting when and I might be paraphrasing it when he was in the police he was writing all the big songs but he knew if he became a millionaire and not the rest of the people and didn't divide up equity they certainly would be pissed when he shows up to the studio in a Rolls Royce and they're leaving in a Hyundai yeah um which 
you know, there's just – you want to build a sustainable business and the only way that I knew how was having a sustainable band. The band lasted way longer than our success should have allowed <laughs> us for. <laughs> so no offense to the rest of the guys in the band, Sexy Joe, Randy, and Jesse. But we, uh, we certainly had a lot of fun and that also was key. Having fun in business – you know, you know what it's like when you show up to the office and you're the only one there doing your thing. You gotta or, love what you do. Well, you gotta love what you do, but also working with good people. Otherwise, you're bored off your ass, and you're yeah, like, "Oh, yeah. what time's lunch day? What time can I get out of here?" Right. I don't want. You know, there were times when I've like, I don't want to leave the office. I want to, you know. And I spend so much time traveling with members of our team, and now the new team that we have through LA. You know, it doesn't matter how much money. Olay would have offered us for this business if we didn't like them and feel like we could be all part of this ecosystem, mm -hmm. the deal never would have worked. Yeah. Money yeah. doesn't you know, so solve any of those issues. It does In it. fact, it can make it worse and amplify things. Exactly. And, you, and right now, what you experience is this is your baby. Yeah. That you've created, right? Yeah. This is incredible. So let me ask you this. So your first major, your first real paycheck, what did you spend it on? <laughs> well, uh, have you ever seen the movie The Jerk? Yes. There's a scene where he's like, all I need is this ping pong paddle <laughs> and this wolf. And this. the day that we sold to WME, I think I went with my wife for mimosas and Abbott Kinney got super drunk because I didn't know what I wanted. I like, didn't have anything for so long. And uh, we saw, you know, I ended up just buying a stuffed wolf. Buying a giant, like, a bunch of <laughs> jeans from Stronghold that I never wear because <laughs> they're just, like, so I, bought, I think I bought a pair of coveralls and uh, I don't even know what I bought. And then I bought, like, a really bottle, ex expensive bottle of tequila and I woke up in the morning and I had, like, a shame hangover. I was like, what did I do? <laughs> Look at this wolf. But the wolf is still in my life and he's a, he uh, lives in my living room. It's not a real wolf. If anyone thinks that we stuffed and killed a wolf, it was, like, some horrible toy stuffed wolf. <laughs> His name's Gustav. <laughs> Gustav, you use that name. <laughs> yeah, my name. Then. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Your studio must look pretty awesome, bonkers. We, we have very cool studios. Shout out to uh, Scout Living. They basically brought our crazy dreams to life because, again, when we were starting the company, I want, I always had this vision. And there is, again, I'm a big believer in this thing called flow. If you're not comfortable. In your space, you're not going to operate at peak performance. It's and that feng shui thing going on. Yeah, and, and there's actually a really amazing book by a, a psychi psychologist Psychotic. who was talking about, uh, you know, the flow. And you experience sometimes when you're jogging or creating a piece of music or doing paperwork, something where you're not fully conscious of it but executing at 100%. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, flow is part of it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have a studio where we have, create, you know, we have some artisanal wood on the wall like you – um, fun, you know, chachkas, just uh, it's creative clutter. And if something is too pristine and clean to me, I just, I, oh my God, I can't even focus. There's too many things to look at. <laughs> but if I'm surrounded, like the best example is um, I we bought an Airstream recently uh, that I use as my home studio. I can see you use it. And I have all these studios that I can use at Jingle Punks that are more professional, bigger, airy, but I like to compose in the Airstream because I'm like whoosh, sucked in there. I can sit on my little bench and just like work. And then if I have to finish tracks, I can go to a more professionalized place. But to sketch out creative ideas, that is very important to me. That's your world. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank for sharing you. your story. You are like <laughs> awesome. And, and and I mean, this is just incredible. Thank you for telling us all this. And and I, I can't wait to check out your studio. We'll have to make a trip because yeah, you're please. in LA. This is now awesome. that we know each other, we can uh, now, now we're family. go for cocktails, I you know, know, hang out. You guys are awesome. And I, and I, there's so much more to learn about, Jared. So with that, Jared, how can how can we keep in touch and, and find out and follow your journey? So Jingle Jared on Instagram. I'm more active on Instagram than any of the other ones, but it feeds to my Twitter and to my Facebook. But I love telling my story through photos. I don't know what it is. I'm not a photographer, but I love. I feel like there's just a really good You're way. Yeah, I just like to you know do wacky things during the day. Sometimes I say I over Instagram, but I think I Instagram just enough. <laughs> See, I love that. You know, you know, because I'm so glad that you told me that because I actually didn't get on Instagram. Until our friend Chitty is like, when he got to get an Instagram. Oh, I literally just got him four months ago. It's amazing. I mean, look, everyone has their thing. There's Snapchat, there's Twitter, there's Facebook, and there's probably a dozen other things I'm forgetting, but Instagram is my favorite. It's your baby. Well, yeah. for that, we're going to definitely connect with you. So I love that. And you want to connect with me, you can always do so, winnieson.com, and I'm really active on Twitter, Sun Group WP. And with that, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was fun.